Hello there, I'm Rob Shimshock, reporter for the Daily Caller News Foundation, and today I'd like to welcome to the Shimshock Show University of Toronto psychology professor Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Jordan, how are you? I'm well, thanks for the invitation. No problem. Now, Jordan found himself in the heart of the culture war in Canada when he had the audacity to say that he would not use preferred gender pronouns for students or faculty, which could range from calling a biological male a she to calling him a they or even one of those made up ones like Z or Zier. But now with the passing of Bill C-16, it seems like the groundwork is in place for you to be prosecuted for refusing to use these pronouns, Jordan. Could you... Well, Yes. It, uh, just one clarification. I actually didn't have any problem with he or she. My objection wasn't particularly to that. So it really wasn't it wasn't an objection to the issue of transgenderism, so to speak, at all. What it was was a pronounced objection to using made up the pronouns that, in my estimation, have been generated by postmodern ideologues. It was an objection fundamentally to postmodern ideology rather than to transgender, than, than to the it was only peripherally associated in some sense with the transgender issue. But there's no way that I'm using the, the neologisms of postmodernists. That's not happening. So that's the real issue. Okay, so could you explain a little bit more about Bill C-16, which I guess is now legislation, and how it affects free speech in Canada? Well, C-16 purports to do nothing but bring protection for transgendered individuals under the Canadian Human Rights Code. And... Um, it, so it it makes harassment or discrimination on the it forbids harassment or discrimination on the basis of gender expression or gender identity. Um, the problem is is with the surrounding policies through which that piece of legislation will be interpreted. It also allows for hate crime prosecution, by the way, under the same under the same uh, um, um, policies. But the problem is with the policy cloud that surrounds it, mostly as it's been written by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So Ontario, of course, being a province in Canada where that legislation had already been passed at the provincial level. The, the provincial legislation is extremely wide ranging and seems to mandate, mandate, for example, the use of the pronouns that a person chooses as, as a required part of normal discourse, normative discourse with the possibility of penalties if you fail to do so. Now, the activists who've been pushing for this legislation claim that there would be no prosecutions for such things, but when in the Canadian Senate, an amendment was proposed to make that clear, the federal department, of, the federal minister of justice refused to entertain the amendment, which, so, and it was a pretty straightforward amendment. It basically just said that this uh, new um, amendment to the Ontario or to the Canadian Human Rights Code wouldn't be used to violate any any of the uh, wouldn't be wouldn't interfere with Canadians' right to free speech. Now it was it was it was produced in the appropriate legalese, obviously, but she rejected it out of hand. So and all as far as I'm concerned, all that can do is fuel justifiable skepticism about the true intent of this of this bill. Right. Okay. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, because obviously your opinion has been at odds with some other professors, both at um, both in Canada and around the world. Um, so I'd like to hear a bit more about your experience as one of the few non-progressive professors in academia. How are you treated by students, fellow professors, and administrators? Do they treat your opinions with a greater degree of genuine curiosity because of their scarcity within what some might see as the echo chamber of academia? Or is well, every word met with suspicion and regarded as some sort no, of... No, no, I wouldn't say so. Like, I've been teaching for a long time, you know, um, about about 30 years. And I would say that my course content is rather unexpected because I teach courses on the psychology of religion and the content is idiosyncratic. That, that might be a good way to put it. But my, I've always had very, very good responses from students. I mean, generally speaking... And when I was there, my courses were regularly rated as among the highest. Uh, they received the highest ratings from students in, in the department or among the highest ratings. And that was true at the University of Toronto until they followed up the student um, evaluation process about three years ago. But no, I mean, I've had and I should also say that the University of Toronto is not a particularly politically correct institute. So most of the students are. They're, most of the students are 
there to receive an education and to work hard. They're not, and and so it's it's odd in some sense that all of this blew up at the University of Toronto. Now, there are a minority of faculty members, administrators, and students who are part of the radical left postmodern fringe. And they're, they're basically situated in precisely the disciplines where you would expect them to be situated. And when I made my videos last September, voicing my objection not only to Bill C-16, but also to the University of Toronto Human Resources Department decision, Department of Human Resources and Equity, their decision to make um, anti-unconscious bias training mandatory for their staff, I also objected to that, partly on scientific grounds, and that's when the political turmoil erupted. Now, the University of Toronto did send me two warning letters telling me to stop saying what I was saying because they felt that it might transgress against their own code of conduct and also against the Ontario Human Rights uh, Act, as it was currently instantiated in legislation. But I must say that the university came around pretty quickly. Um, once there was public outcry about their treatment of me. And they were confused, you know, they were confused about how to react because the legislation was new and then I, and pending and new, and then I announced my opposition to it. And they that put them in a quandary, right? Because they weren't sure if what I was doing was illegal. And if what I was doing was illegal, then they had to do something about it. And then the university reacted reasonably intelligently, I would say, because they enabled, they allowed me to hold a debate with my opponents and we, we, we publicized that on YouTube. And I would say that my relationships with the administration at the University of Toronto and, and certainly with my fel fellow faculty members is at least um, amicable. So, and the students are fine. I went back teaching in January and the students' response was overwhelmingly positive. So that's all on the upside. Great, so I wanted to ask you a bit about some of the concepts you were alluding to earlier. Um, and these are more concepts like multiculturalism, diversity. And yep. so when, when taken to task on the merits of these concepts and their implementation through programs like affirmative action on campus, yep. progressives often, uh, they say studies show that diversity increases productivity in the office and even results in perhaps a more lucrative office. And so I was wondering, is there any truth to these claims no. from your research? No. I don't buy that. Those, those. So, what what increases productivity are the, the the data on productivity is quite clear, although it differs with the type of productivity. So, for example, if you're trying to predict productivity in entrepreneurial jobs, you want people who are complex entrepreneurial jobs. Say, you want people who are highly intelligent and who are high in the personality trait openness. And if you want people who are good at complex managerial and administrative jobs, you want intelligent people who are high in conscientiousness. And as the complexity of the job decreases, the role of intelligence decreases as well. And with regards to diversity, I mean, how in the world are you going to define diversity with regards to predicting productivity in those jobs? And how do you know that it's not contaminated with other third variables, even if the studies do show a correlation? You don't know because it's not random assignment. And so even if there is correlation between, say, the, a variety of ethnicities with regards to, um, to hiring practices, you can't determine in any way that I can understand how that has a direct impact on productivity. And none of the, none of the literature and individual differences would suggest that. So, and it, there's also a, a racial and ethnicity essentialism about that that you'd think would be anathema to the postmodernists because they're making the presupposition that diversity is a consequence of race and ethnic identity. And you'd think that that would be an argument that was absolutely abhorrent to them. But they're, the postmodern neo-Marxists are not known for their coherence. Great. Now, uh, aside from some of the free speech stuff that pertains most directly to Bill C-16, I wanted to talk to you a bit about other civil liberties on college campuses. So yeah. I, I saw you tweet out about Harvard University um, rec oh, yeah. recently. They um, inspired some more backlash. I think last year they had actually introduced a policy prohibiting members of single gender groups like frats and sororities from holding certain leadership positions on campus. But this year, after receiving some critique on that, they instead went back to amend it 
And uh, now they're recommending that they would ban these single gender groups entirely yeah. and discipline students found to be in yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. The, okay. the, the universities, the Harvard seems perfectly willing to sacrifice freedom of association to their hypothetical commitment to equity and, 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 and so forth. And I think it's absolutely reprehensible. Steven Pinker has done a no nice job of critiquing them. And of course, he's at Harvard. And uh, yeah, there's just no excuse for the universities to to adopt that sort of stance with regards to the private lives of their students. And if Harvard continues to do such things, they're going to tarnish their brand irreparably. Right. And that's hard because Harvard has a pretty good brand. And so you'd have to work really hard to tarnish it. But that those sorts of shenanigans are defi definitely going to, to have exactly that effect, as they should. Hey, what? I also want to tell you something about what I've got for future plans that your, your viewers might be interested in. Sure. Okay, so I've been trying to figure out what the most effective means of, uh, what would you say, moderating the behavior of the universities might be over the next five years or so. And one of the things I had suggested in Canada, I mean, it's a radical suggestion, and it was done in irritation, I would say, to some degree, was that the, the governments, especially ones that are more oriented in the conservative direction, might consider cutting the funding of the universities by 25% until they sorted out their priorities. And so, and that would mean to stop indoctrinating students with with left wing, with radical left wing postmodern nonsense, which isn't education. It's clearly indoctrination. And if it was happening, if if equivalent steps were being taken on campus with regards to right wing indoctrination, the outcry would be deafening. But then I thought that's not a very good solution because you don't want the government regulating the content of university education. It's too dangerous. Uh, it's certainly not something that a small government conservative would be interested in implementing. You know. So then I thought, well, maybe what I should do instead is to cut off the supply chain to the courses. So I'm going to launch a website in the next month that, that's, that's been programmed by someone with some expertise in artificial intelligence. And he's training it at the moment to recognize postmodern neo-Marxist written content. And so what you'll be able to do is to go to this website and cut the course description out of the university catalog. We'll also strip the catalogs of all the course descriptions so some of this will be done automatically but you'll be able to paste cut and paste the content of the course description into the website along with the professor's name and the subdiscipline and the university and it will tell you on a scale how much postmodern neo-marxist indoctrination is likely to result as a consequence of, the, of taking the course and so it'll give you a thumbs up if it's a course that you should take because it's an act it actually has educational content or a thumbs down if it's just a matter of postmodern indoctrination. And then, of course, if you want to be indoctrinated into postmodern neo-Marxism, you can use the site for that purpose too. But we're hoping that um, if we inform consumers, you know, incoming university students and their parents, then perhaps we could drive the enrollment down in these disciplines by 75% over the next five years, like across the Western world. So that that's the next thing to 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 be launched. That should happen within the next month. Great. And I so, so I think what you're really implying here is that the power still does lie with the consumer. And so, for example, at Evergreen State College, they were looking at perhaps the Washington State legislator, legislature denying them appropriations. However, it is um, a Democrat-controlled legislature, so it doesn't look like that's going to happen. However, before with the University of Missouri, Mizzou, they had the protests. And now look what's happened a couple years down the line. The enrollment's down and the yes. university is suffering in terms of the tuition money they get. Yes. Well, that's exactly, I think that's the right approach because, you know, assuming that, that, that it would be better to keep this sort of regulation within the domain of the autonomous free market, then it seems like the logical thing to do is provide people with more consumer oriented information before they make their course descriptions. It'll also enable us, I think, to identify with some degree of certainty, the most, the most postmodern neo-Marxist politically correct universities and the ones that are the least that way. I mean, Jonathan Haidt has done some of that with his heterodox academy, ranking universities with regards to their commitment to truth versus their commitment to social justice, right? And he ranked University of Chicago number one with regards to commitment to truth and Brown University, I believe, number one with regards to commitment to social justice. But this might be a more rigorous way of doing that. We should be able to rank order universities by their social justice commitment um, and also disciplines. Because I would also like to know which of the disciplines have become particularly corrupt. Right now, I kind of have to guess, you know, with women's studies and the ethnic studies, um, 
so-called disciplines obviously leading the pack with maybe education and social work, a couple of disciplines and sociology, you know, bringing up a close second. But I'd rather not guess. I'd rather know. And and it just seems to me that there's absolutely no downside to to educating the consumer and that that might be the most effective way to bring this problem under control or in the medium to long run. Because the problem is people might say, well, who cares what happens in the universities? But that's a very short sighted perspective, because for better or worse, the universities train the people who run organizations. And if the universities are indoctrinating people and also the lower echelons of the education system increasingly, then there's going to be spillover into the general population very, very rapidly. And you see this already, I think, most specifically with regards to human resources uh, departments inside large corporations, because they're often full of, of postmodern neo-Marxist types who are equity and diversity oriented beyond, beyond, beyond all um, reasonable, beyond all reasonableness. And they make the assumption that diverse, this is a very offensive assumption that diversity in opinion and performance is a consequence of diversity of race and ethnicity. I mean, as if those things are somehow integrally tied to race and ethnicity and cultural background, which is, of, it, it's exactly the sort of claim that the most radical of bigots were making in the 1950s. So it's so funny to see these things reverse like that. Because it was the racists that were that were essentialists back in the 1950s, especially with regards to race. And now it's like, oh, well, we have to have a diverse range of races because otherwise we don't have diversity. It's like, really, really, that's how it works. And, you know, the data is absolutely clear there. There are differences. There are some racial differences. You know, it's tricky because it's not easy to define race because obviously we're one species. And so the racial boundaries are very fluid and movable. But having said that, you can make firsthand approximations to some racial differences. So, for example, black people are more likely to get high blood pressure if they consume too much salt. You know, you can you can make those sorts of generalizations. But that but there's way more variability within a given racial group than there is between racial groups. Way more. Way, and the same thing applies with regards to the differences between men and women. There are differences between men and women. But there's more differences within men than there are between men and women. And so the argument that diversity is fundamentally to be found by mingling, you know, by, by enforcing racial, by enforcing racial quotas or gender quotas or ethnic quotas or something like that is, it's, it's an appalling argument. And there's, there's, no, there's no reason to assume that it's in the least bit valid, quite the contrary. Right, and it does seem to be the case that the double think and the hypocrisy goes right over their heads. Now, I want to turn from the political lands or from the educational um, landscape to more of like the political and cultural landscape. So, aside from Bill C sixteen, can you tell us a bit about Justin Trudeau and the current political trajectory of Canada? Is Canada becoming a more or less free place, and how does it look compared to America and the rest of the West? Well, Canada is a strange place. I mean, I'm not happy at all with the current government in the province of Ontario, which is a liberal government. In We have three main political parties, eh? a socialist party, the NDP, a main line, a mainstream party, let's say, kind of middle of the road, the liberals, and a more right-leaning party, the conservatives. But they're all to the left of your political spectrum. Mm. So our conservatives are less conservative than your conservatives, let's say. And we have a liberal government in Ontario, and putatively, that's a that's a middle of the road government, but it's very radically leftist. And it's done some reprehensible things over the last year. And it's had a tremendous impact on the federal liberal government, which is now run by Justin Trudeau, which is leaning far more to the left than a liberal government should. So what's happened, what seems to have happened, and this seems to be happening in England as well, is that the social justice types, the politically correct types, they actually don't care that much about the nomenclature of their allegiance. They're very much inclined to infiltrate, so to speak, organizations regardless of their stated purpose and to, and to do their best to take up leadership positions. And they're taught to do that by the activists who teach them in universities. And so I would say the Liberal Party in Canada has tilted very strongly to the left, which isn't what the electorate expected because they would have voted for the NDP, the Socialist Party, if they wanted a left-leaning party. So they got a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
And even the Conservative Party in Canada, which is more leaning to the right, the Conservatives in Canada are quite afraid, like the real Conservative politicians um, at the level of the rep, of rep, individual representatives, say, and senators for that matter. They're very much afraid that if they come out as social conservatives, that they'll be mobbed by the social justice activists and taken down. And so the conservatives in Canada are afraid to speak up as conservatives, which means that, of course, that they're essentially, they're doing themselves in because if you're a conservative and you can't say what you think, then you've already lost. And so that's not good. And, and it's not good for Canada because we've done a very good job of continuing a responsible and productive discussion between the right which is pretty moderate in Canada, and the left, which is pretty moderate in Canada, and keeping the whole country nicely balanced between those two extremes, you know, and it, it's worked because, so for example, I lived in the States for five years, six years when I was teaching at Boston, and I had a chance to look at the difference between the Canadian healthcare system and the American healthcare system in some detail. And it seems indisputable, I would say, that the Canadian healthcare system is preferable to the American healthcare system, except at the very highest end. And um, one of the, and there's a couple of reasons for that that would even perhaps appeal to conservatives. One is the amount of administrative overhead that's spent by Canadian health institutions is far less in Canada than it is in the US. Partly because hospitals don't have to collect money. So they don't spend 30% of their intake on on the financial end of the equation, which is approximately the case in the US. And uh, everyone has access to healthcare in Canada. And because of that, our rate of individual entrepreneurship is higher in Canada than it is in the US. And that's because, because people don't have to worry about losing their healthcare if they switch jobs, they can switch jobs more easily. And they can also take risks if they have a family, they can take entrepreneurial risks without putting all the health of their entire family at stake. So these things can't be broken down really simply into right wing versus left wing issues, right? They're too complicated. But the overall point is that Canada has done a very good job of having that um, conversation. Even our socialists are basically fiscally conservative, right? Although they're not socially conservative, but there, there, there are signs of the kind of polarization in Canada that that are that's really plaguing the United States, and of course that would be that's not good for the U.S. It's not good for Europe, where it's also happening, but it's also not good for our country. And I don't want that to happen, so that's partly why I've been objecting to the more ill-advised and radical moves that the so-called liberals have been managing over the last few years. Right now, so for my final question, I wanted to ask you something um, on more of the personal dimension of things. So we hear so often nowadays stories about people losing friends on Facebook after expressing a political opinion, or people who, for instance, uh, feel like they have to subscribe to some sort of dogmatic group thing just in order to maintain their friend group. My personal philosophy has always been that people should disagree but never demonize, but that defi definitely hasn't been my experience all the time. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Jordan, why has the personal become political, and what, if anything, can be done about it? Well, let's start with the second one. What can be done about it? There's, there's a variety of things that can be done about it, one of which I would say is it's useful to talk to people that you don't agree with. And it's, it's useful for a variety of reasons. And one is that a lot of what determines your political orientation is biological temperament, far more than people realize. So for example, left-leaning people, liberals, let's say, although that's kind of a mis misnomer, but we'll keep with the terminology. Liberals are high in a trait called openness, which is one of the big five personality traits. And it's associated with interest in abstraction and interest in aesthetics. It's the best predictor of liberal political leaning. And they're low in trait conscientiousness, which is dutifulness and, and orderliness in particular. Whereas the conservatives are the opposite. They're high in conscientiousness, they're dutiful and orderly, and they're low in openness. And that makes them really good managers and administrators, administrators and often businessmen, but not very good entrepreneurs. Because the entrepreneurs are almost all drawn from the liberal types. And so these are really fundamental, fundamentally biologically predicated differences. And you might think about them as different sets of, of, of 
opportunities and limitations and, and certainly different ways of screening the world. And each of those different temperamental types needs the other type. So in, economically speaking, for example, we need liberals to start businesses and we need conservatives to run them. And the conservatives are too conservative. So if they are running businesses, they have a bitch of a time with innovation. Whereas the liberals are really good at generating new ideas and, and moving laterally, but they're not very good at the level of detail and implementation. And so if you start understanding that the person, this is a diversity issue, let's call this a diversity issue. If you start understanding that the person that you're talking to who doesn't share your political views isn't stupid, that's the first thing necessarily, they might be, but so might you be. You know, stupidity isn't the... Differences in intelligence are not the prime determinant of differences in political belief. All right, so you might be talking to someone who's more conscientious and less creative than you if, you're, if you happen to be a liberal. But that doesn't mean that that person's perspective is not valid. And it doesn't mean that they wouldn't outperform you in some domains because they would. So one thing to remember is people actually do see the world differently. It's not merely that, they, that they're possessed of of, of ill-informed opinions. So you have to, first of all, stretch out your hand and say, look, you know, like I, I get that you see the world differently than me. And I also understand that there's a place for you and a place for me, even though that isn't the same place. And then it's necessary to also remember that, well, do you want to talk to people or do you want to, do you want to fight with them? Because fighting is not pleasant and it goes very dark places very, very rapidly. And so, you know, the last time I was down in, in Boston, I talked to an old friend of mine, and uh, this person went on a relatively um, solid and strong and relatively personal critique of, of Trump supporters, calling them ill-informed and stupid and, and, you know, an insulting, an, an insulting characterization. And I thought, well, it was surprising to me because this was a a reasonable person. And I think it was an indication of the polarization. But, you know, you can't throw away 50% of the population like that. It's not reasonable. And it's the same on the right. The conservatives can't do it to the liberals either. I mean, right now, I think that that radical left totalitarian proclivity is a much greater danger than radical right totalitarian proclivity, especially on the university campuses. And so I've been mostly speaking out about the about the left wing radicals. It could have just as easily been the reverse case. It just doesn't happen to be. But you, the whole point of the of a democracy is to continue the dialogue between people of different temperamental types, so that we don't move so far to the right that everything becomes encapsulated in stone and doesn't move, or so far to the left that everything dissolves in a kind of uh, mealy mouthed chaos. And the only way that you can you can navigate between those two shoals is by is through discussion, which is why free speech is such an important value. It's the thing that keeps the temperamental types from being at each other's throats, just like in a marriage, you know, because there's differences in a marriage. If you can't talk, you either you're either subservient or you fight. Well, that's just no good. So so part of it is. Have some respect for people that are different than you, which is, of course, what the radical leftists are saying, but they, they don't identify the real differences. So, and then, I, well, I, I'm afraid I don't remember the first part of that question. It was, the second part was what can be done about it? Oh yes, what's causing the polarization? Oh, well, I think that's pretty straightforward. What's causing the polarization is a form of accumulated insanity on the radical left that's mostly permeated the university systems and also spilled into the general population. Like I can point a finger pretty clearly to that. If I really do believe that the fundamental cause isn't the alt-right, I don't even necessarily believe that the alt-right exists. I think it's mostly a, a loose collection of people who are half satirical in what they're doing. But the radical left certainly exists and it certainly dominates the universities. I mean, the, 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 the statistical evidence for that is overwhelming. So I think, I think Democrats are, or conservatives are outnumbered by Democrats in the humanities in the US at a rate of about 30 to one, it's something like that. And so what that means is that what passes for a centrist position in the typical humanities department in 
a university is far to the left of the center of the general population. That's really not good. So that's partly why I'm putting up this website so that, you know, so that the balance can be redressed. Right. It does seem to be that um, communication is key, the old adage, and whether it's free speech and dialogue or whether it's these databases like um, the one you're starting or even ones like Open Secrets that track um, donations between institutions and political campaigns, I think definitely more speech is always better. So thank you very much for speaking with me today, Jordan. Is there anywhere people can find you on the Internet? Well, they can they can look two places. They can look at my website, which is jordanbpeterson.com, or they can watch my YouTube channel. There's a lot of information there, some of it, most of it philosophical and psychological, a subset of it dealing with political issues, and that's Jordan Peterson videos. So, and I'm putting up a new clip channel this week. It's Jordan B. Peterson videos, actually. I'm putting up a new clip channel this week that'll have five to 10 minute cuts. So, um, the other thing I might mention is I have a, I have some software to help people sort themselves out rather than sorting the world out, which I would also recommend. And it's software that helps people write a life plan, among other things, as well as an autobiography. And that helps students stay in university. It, it produces about a 30% improvement in retention among university students. And that's available at selfauthoring.com. And maybe I could put up a discount for your viewers. Sure, yes. Yeah, I'll put up a 20% discount for your viewers, okay? And I'll, and I'll send you the link for that, if that would be acceptable to you. All right, sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jordan, and please keep up the good fight. Uh, with the Daily Caller News Foundation, this has been Rob Shimshok. Take care.